Over the coming weeks, I want to write a sort of love letter to America, the country where I've lived and worked as an art critic for more than 25 years. It won't be uncritical, it won't be without its gripes, but it definitely will be an expression of gratitude for what its creative life has shown me. I want to show something of what we can tell about Americans from the things that they've made and how these images act in the story of American experience. When we look at them through the lens of their art, what do we see? The new America was fascinated by the ancients. Classical Greece, Republican Rome. The values of these civilizations became American ideals too. Democracy, civic responsibility, public virtue. Their imagery saturated American culture right from the Republic's beginning in the 18th century and continues in weirdly mutated form sometimes down to the present day. What would the Founding Fathers have made of this modern site of American classicism, Las Vegas? To them it would have seemed eerily familiar and yet scarcely recognisable. They thought the classical column held up the Republican temple of virtue. We prefer it to support the popular palace of middle-class sin. Today there aren't too many classicists in a place like Las Vegas, but the allure of Rome, like old man Tiber, just keeps on rolling along. Except that it's a different Rome, not the virtuous republic of George Washington, but rather the late empire of Frank Sinatra and Bob Guccione. Caesars and senators, centurions and slave girls. The Rome of Hollywood of excess and authority, heavily overlaid with pasta, meatballs and pets of the month. There are places in Italy where you can still escape the classical past, but in America it's not so easy. This is Caesar's Mall, a moon colony for shoppers in the Nevada desert with a sky that cycles through from rosy dawn to purple dusk every half hour with computer-controlled lights. It is not what 18th century Americans had in mind when they called for a public architecture based upon the severe forms of ancient Rome. The new republic was weak, only its ideals were strong. Classicism gave it a language of power and authority and of continuity with the past, even though it was so new. To choose a new capital is a radical act for any state. The founding fathers of the American Republic didn't want to take an existing city like New York or Philadelphia and just call it the capital of the United States of America. They wanted a clean slate, a very American desire, an empty site where the Republican vision would not be blurred by earlier royalist and colonial meanings. The place they chose in 1791 was empty all right because up to then nobody in his right mind would have wanted to live there. It was a tract of hot, humid marshland beside the Potomac River with a few tobacco farms and a large and rich variety of animal life, mostly mosquitoes. But this was to be the site of the new Rome, and they called it Washington. A mere hypothesis at first, just a bunch of lines on a surveyor's map. 
but it was to grow into the most powerful city on earth. The ambitions of the revolutionary leaders, among them George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, were large and they found expression in the plan for the capital of the new republic. It takes its form from the greatest metaphor of royal autocracy in France, the gardens of Versailles, designed by Le Nôtre for Louis XIV in the 17th century. Washington's designer was also French, an engineer named Pierre L'Enfant. Versailles' imagery of great corridors of power radiating from the palace becomes L'Enfant's plan of grid and boulevards. A hugely ambitious design, and it took more than a century to fill it in. And yet this ambition allowed the Founding Fathers to show how they rejected the Englishness that was all around them. This had become one of the more disliked buildings of the old regime, the English governor's palace in Williamsburg, capital of the colony of Virginia. Its architecture is English, not French in origin. The balcony signifies government by proclamation, the governor issuing his orders from above to the king's subjects below. When you, the colonist, entered the hall and saw the 774 weapons that decorated it, you might have been reassured by the display of military power. And if you had any Republican thoughts, you might have been intimidated. But this kind of building and the town it anchored as an image of royal authority had nothing like the symbolic charge that the American revolutionaries imagined for their architecture. A young man who studied law in Williamsburg wrote that its architecture was in the worst style I ever saw and said of Virginia in general that the genius of architecture has cast its maledictions over this land. This was Thomas Jefferson and he would become the third president of the United States. But he was an architect before the revolution. His father gave him a classical education, a political background, and thousands of acres of rural Virginia. By 1767, he was designing himself a house on a hill deep in the Virginian countryside near Charlottesville. He called it Monticello. He was to work on it, tinker with it, for the best part of 40 years. Monticello is pervaded with enormous aesthetic ambition. It was also this great amateur's spiritual centre, his hearth, and his refuge from the painful stress of political life. If I had to pick one person from all the dead Americans that I wish I could talk to, that man would be Thomas Jefferson, and the reason is the overwhelmingly attractive cast of his mind. He was one of those rare people who want to build everything up from first principles and do it without a trace of fanaticism or self-pity or cant. He was the living proof of William Blake's dictum that energy is eternal delight. He was revolutionary, statesman, diplomat, president, constitutionalist, educator, farmer, botanist and the founder of American architecture. Reading him, you feel his enthusiasm and curiosity on your face like sunburn. He lived far beyond his means and was constantly in debt from the huge sums that he spent building and furnishing Monticello. And under the surface of the 18th century Whig reasonableness, there is something immoderate and crazy about Jefferson and, very important from my point of view, he was the patron saint of all do-it-yourselfers, a fact to which Monticello bears witness. He was always looking for details of convenience. The portholes in the wall up there above his bed are there to ventilate his winter wardrobe. 
He designed a machine to make copies of his letters, and he wrote about 18,000 of them over his lifetime. He designed a clock to record the days of the week as well as the time of day. Cannonball weights moved down the walls, past the day markers. Unfortunately, the hall of Monticello wasn't high enough, so he had to cut a hole in the floor and put the rest of the days in the cellar. 